So um, I guess just to, to voice our welcome again, um, one of the things that's really important is also figuring out how it is that you mobilize people to get you um, on your mission in the same direction. And so we're going to talk briefly about the ACGME and diversity uh, new guidelines for the uh, CPR. Hopefully not CPR like this. Um, <laughs> Okay, this is not a, a cardiac talk. Uh, this is the uh, ACGME Common Program Requirements Guidelines. Uh, and there's a new set of guidelines that have been published that actually go into effect uh, for various requirements, some of them going into effect on July 1st, 2019. We'll, we're going to go over those and talk to you um, about how it is that you institute these guidelines and how it is that you garner support at your institution to make sure that you're able to move forward with diversity. One of the other components of this, though, is, is that we know that there are a lot of big brains in the room. And a lot of you have already done things along these lines and have ideas about how it is to, to mobilize folks to make things happen at your own institution. So please feel free to jump in. We really want this to be more of a discussion than anything else. And how many people here are not involved in the residency leadership? So in medical education, maybe, at least, but maybe not in residency selection. Good. This is going to be helpful as we go along. There's going to be some alphabet soup, kind of like with any part of, of medicine or um, any, any profession, there's alphabet soup, but also in medical education there is too. And so we'll be helping to explain some of these, uh, these different ones. So the first one is the, uh, the current program guidelines that says that uh, residents have to demonstrate sensitivity and responsiveness to a diverse patient population. Uh, the new one says that they have to respect and respond to diverse patient populations. So essentially there's really not much of a change for that one. Um, and to be honest, that's not the one that you're going to look at in terms of trying to motivate people to change things at your program. However, um, the next one is a fairly long one. Uh, but what we're going to do is break it down into parts. We're not going to read it to you immediately here. The first part is about recruitment and retention. And each one of these elements we think is really, really important in terms of what these new requirements are that never existed before in terms of what was important for your program and for recruitment and retention. Uh, and so, oh, come on. Uh, sorry. So the first one talks about recruitment and retention of a diverse and uh, inclusive workforce of fellows faculty members, senior uh, administrative staff, and other members of the community. Secondarily, in partnership with the sponsoring institution. Third, on a mission-driven, ongoing, and systematic basis. And then lastly, that there has to be an evaluation component to it. Um, and then the last, the last one that addresses diversity is, is that there has to be an aggregate resident and faculty workforce diversity uh, component that's associated with your assessment. And like we said, that this all has to be done by July 1st, 2019. That's for all of these program requirements. So going to this, just to explain a little bit about how this works. For those of you in GME, you will understand this. So I just want to talk for, to everyone so they understand. But in order to get accredited as a residency program, uh, you have to have certain things. One of them is a program evaluation committee. And basically what you're doing is it's taking what have we done, what's the state of the union, where are we going forward, and submit it to the ACGME. It's required for accreditation. As part of this, what you submit, the actual thing you submit is the annual program evaluation. And so what we're going to talk is about what needs to be put in there. What are they going to be looking for in order for you to have your, um, your department run a residency program? And so while there is this thing, okay, this is what's required, the CPR, the common program requirements. I don't know about you, there are definitely people in my program that are, we are more research-based, you know, more administrative. And so they might just go and say, hey, your, your research, your um, residency education leadership, it's your problem. You handle this. This is your wheelhouse. I'm not involved in this, right? So I think part of this is understanding when it comes to diversity, when it comes to enhancing diversity for our programs, for our profession, this takes everyone. This is not just diversity to diversity's sake. This is actually part of a larger national discussion, a larger mission. And so what I'd like to, I'm going to give a little bit of what, what I went through, how I talked to um, those faculty members, uh, some of the strategies that I used to share with you about getting them on board too and helping them see things. So first thing I thought about was, okay, those people who are more, um, uh, more research-minded, more administrative, business-minded, I told them, hey, this is 
not just us. Other professions are dealing with diversity. And as Dr. Hayes kind of mentioned before, in business, quite importantly, we know that those businesses that have more diversity in, in leadership, that's correlated with profitability in terms of dollars. And what I then point out to them is that if you don't have diversity, this can have disastrous consequences. Okay, so then I reach a little bit, I'm getting them out of medicine a little bit, and I say, hey, last year, Gucci, they came out with this. Right? I mean, <laughs> it's basically blackface in a sweater. This went through so many different stages and then was actually produced last year. And you can imagine what happened to Gucci and their parent, they don't actually have stock, their parent company, how they did, their reputation, and what it costs in terms of millions of dollars, okay? And already retail is doing terribly, okay? This is another thing that came out of Zara. Cute, right? Right! Right! And so this was all correlated with a lack of diversity in the whole, I mean, in many different stages. And so the consequences of having a lack of diversity, um, you know, can mean millions of dollars. And in medicine, yes, it can, medicine, it can mean millions of dollars as well, two billions, I would say. But really, the currency in healthcare are lives, morbidity and mortality. And so then I transition with them and help them kind of see this. Yes, it's money, but also the main thing, it's lives. Because what happens with lack of diversity and racism in healthcare is healthcare disparities. It happens everything from, and I explain to them and show them the data for interventional cardiology outcomes, just over mortality, maternal health, maternal mortality, explain to them too, because they may know this, they may not, and also outcomes in cancer care. Not only cancer care um, that we provide and outcomes, but also the willingness of our patients to come to us for the care that they need when they most need it. Um, and what I do tell them, and um, doctors already mentioned some of this already, is that to combat this is to address, to address healthcare disparities. Diversity can do that. We have some evidence. We know that those who are underrepresented in medicine are more likely to work in places that are underserved. That those um, providers who are underrepresented, underrepresented minorities, are more likely to engage in interactions with our patients in ways that our patients value as well, too in the clinical learning environment. So not uh, already kind of mentioned, but everyone benefits. Not only patients, but medical students, residents, faculty, they benefit with a diverse clinical learning environment. And then I brought in something a little bit more local because I live in Oakland. I want to bring in, hey, so um, to talk to uh, our faculty, all types of faculty at, at our shop, I pointed out to this great study that came out last year from the National Bureau of Economics and Research. And what it is, they actually randomized black men in Oakland to a black doctor or non-black doctor. And what they found was that those who received care from a black doctor were more likely to um, have preventive services, including invasive um, medical services, than those who than if you did not see, those black men did not see a black doctor. And, and for those patients who had um, even higher rates, self-rated as higher mistrust in the healthcare system, the effect was even more profound. So, so I'm just curious, how many of you guys have the ultrasound guy at your institution? Like the one guy that that's what they focus on is ultrasound? Yeah. <laughs> It's like they're like a one-trick pony. It's like, oh, you can ultrasound that. Yeah, you can ultrasound that, right? So what happens when you go to the ultrasound guy and you say, hey, you know what? We need some resources for diversity. What do they say? No, that's right. Exactly, exactly. And what happens when you go to the EMS guy and you say, hey, we need some resources for diversity? And they say, no. And to be honest, your, your chair is probably balancing all these things together, right? And so along those lines, one of the things that the, core, that the common program requirements have helped you with is that they've given you a stick. They've given you a way to say to people, we know that this is important, and we have data that shows that this is important, like Dave just said. But now we have a stick that says, if you don't do this, we get cited. Who here is the program director? What do you live in fear of every day is getting cited. And all you have to do is you say to the institution, hey, we may get cited for this. And they say, I don't care. Go, oh, well, you won't have residence. Your emergency department won't, won't function. 
Oh, we care. Okay, hang on, hang on. We care, we care. And so part of this is making sure that people are able to make sure that you are able to meet these requirements. And so this is giving you that stick to help with that conversation of why it's important. That it's not just important for all these different reasons that we've just outlined, but also because it's going to make a difference for you in terms of us providing care for patients with the residents that we have. So the first component is recruitment and retention. And so it's not just about getting people there, right? And there's a lot of data from our institution, from your institution, from a lot of different places that talks about how it is that you recruit, how it is that you recruit across the board. And for residency, the things that we talk about are um, mission-based selection, so making sure that you're using holistic review, uh, inviting the appropriate folks. Second is diversity externships, and the second look dose. And those are sort of the big things that you, we found in emergency medicine that have made a difference. And we can talk a little bit more we're going to run out of time, so we can't talk a little bit more immediately after this, but we can talk a little bit more after our entire session, talking about um, some of the ethics associated with some of these things. But the other component of this is keeping people there, assuring people success once they are in your program. So it's not just the recruitment, it's also the retention. Uh, in terms of r making sure that people stay there, things like mentoring, things like opportunities, and then assuring that people are going to get to where they want to be through early and frequent assessments to make sure that people stay on track. So Jeff, I thought we had an hour, so that's why I, I inserted some extra slides for myself. Because <laughs> I, I did want to back up just a little bit about holistic application review, and I'll be brief on it. Um, so this is a diverse, aware, mission-based approach to recruiting residents, um, as, as Jeff kind of mentioned. And some of the resistance that I received in terms of promoting diversity in, in holistic application review, I'm going to talk a little bit about because this comes up a lot. The first one are board scores. So we know from evidence that if we start screening for board scores, you can have lower diversity in your applicant pool and in your residency program. And so what I tell all my faculty is, let's just think about exactly what the board scores were designed to do. They were not designed to say, hey, this person's going to succeed in residency and this person is not. It wasn't even designed to say, hey, if you have a higher score than someone with a lower score, it detects significant differences in medical knowledge. It was not designed that way. It was designed to say, if you can pass step one, two, and three, you can get licensed, you can practice medicine. And really, that's, that's really about it. We know from Dowen's group that uh, other markers for in the application, AOA. Well, there may be some racial bias in that as well too, because whites are six times more likely than, than blacks to get into AOA, and two times more likely than Asians to get into the, to the AOA. One study that came out last year, I really encourage you to read it. It was, I think, really awesome and really phenomenal, and it did a great job documenting this. This came out of UCSF at the end of last year, and what they looked at was, hey, how many people are getting great honors grades? How many people are getting to AOA? And is there a racial difference? There is, there was. Okay, well, why? So they went back, and this is what I love about this study, they went back and figured out what was the difference. When they went back to the core, uh, core clerkship grades, they go on a zero to um, four scale, and they looked at the difference. You know how the different markers for H&P, medical decision making, professionalism, that kind of stuff. The difference was 0.1, so in surgery, the aggregate was uh, 3.5 versus 3.6, for instance, you know, like a small difference. But in terms of number of honors grades, 50% less. Underrepresented minorities got 50% less honors grades for that 0.1 difference. That's a big ma magnify. In other words, you saw the magnification effect. And then for AOA, three times as many, they were three times as likely to get a, um, whites, were three times more likely to get AOA than, than um, underrepresented minorities. So, you can see that there is some bias that's in there, and I loved how they went about going this. And I think this was helpful, especially for my research-minded folks, to understand where this is all coming from. This is not just something I believe, this is something that bears out through, through the data. And that if you do employ holistic review, at least at the medical school level, you can increase your diversity um, of, of your applicants and diversity of your medical school. I'm sorry, so I had to take that little... Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Do you have to take a little... Yeah, yeah. Go, there. So this is going back now to the... Um, I think, is it next slide? Yeah. Yeah, so the other component of this is, is that the pro common program requirements say of all, um, all levels, so not just residents, which is where a lot of program directors are focused on, but specifically faculty, fellows, and senior administrative staff. So this is across the board. 
Now, I'm just curious, who are your, your colleagues that are going to support you on this? Who can you go to? Those of you that have tried to, to, imp to implement programs like this, who do you go to? Your boss. So your chair? Okay, good. I like it. Yeah? Chair? Who else? Other med ed people. I like it. Yeah? How about other program directors? These are common program requirements. This is every single residency across the board has to do this. And so every residency program in your institution should be focused on the exact same things, and every residency program should be demanding that your institution does the same material. Okay. The next is, is that it's in partnership with the sponsoring institution. That means that your institution has to help you to get to where you want to go. Because let's face it, Program directors aren't the ones that are going to be talking about faculty recruitment, right? That's not within a program director's purview. It'd be nice if it was, right? You just change the world yourself. Hey, this is how it's going to be. No. But the sponsoring institution needs to be the one that's motivating you from this perspective. And so, really, this has, this has a lot to do with the sponsoring institution here, because if they don't get on board, if they aren't on board, we kind of talked about some of these risks as well too. And what they need to be on board with is not just, hey, yes, we support diversity, but need to have tangibles. We need to have something specific. So this, you're on board because you're, we can get resources, we can get funding. We need this for advertising. We need this for our programs that we want to do. So for instance, one of the things that um, I was able to, along with two other faculty members, start uh, this starting this summer, the inaugural year, there's a social emergency medicine diversity extern. So this is for first year medical students after the first year of medical school to come and do some work with us in this summer, specifically learning social emergency medicine research methodology to also get some clinical coaching and mentorship so that for those, even though they're not on the wards yet, they get some exposure um, and I can be, work with them one on one to watch them do their HMPs. Um, anyways, and also to do some community engagement. That takes resources, that takes funding, that takes, um, that takes your sponsoring institution to really partner with you. And you can make these things happen through that. I, I just want to be clear, I haven't heard of any other place that's done that, but that's tremendously innovative. I mean, to have something in between first and second year to try and basically engage students right off the bat into basically a program that you're interested in. I mean, I think that deserves tremendous kudos. I, I think we need to give them a round of applause for that. Okay, so this is the, um, in terms of how we document this, one scaffolding I'd like to point you all out to, there was a publication, um, I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm plugging for my residency program, but I am actually not an author on this paper, but they're from, um, from Highland, there's a publication by Jocelyn Freeman Garrick. She's the lead author on this, and it came, it's in press now at the Annals of Emergency Medicine. I don't think it's actually published yet. It shows you how to document everything for the annual program evaluation. And um, I can give you the reference um, later on, but I don't actually, I just know that it's, it's in press. But what it really allows you, um, what, what is their expected view is that, hey, you're doing this deliberately, you're doing this methodically, and you're being thoughtful um, about, about this. So I want to talk a little bit about the words mission-based. So um, this is, I, I pulled up the Highland mission, uh, and this one is really easy, because uh, if, you, if you look at it and you read, at it, read it, I'm going to have you circle one thing right now, now go forward one more. Eliminate disparities. You know, hey, this is really important. This is part of your mission. It's really easy. Now, I pulled up uh, our institutions. Um, we improve lives. Well, that, that's kind of hard to, to focus on, you know, with that. Um, I think next slide, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, what, what do you do with that? And uh, I think that the answer is, is that either you have to figure out where that line is, and that's going back to the data um, that Dave presented earlier in terms of what it is that makes a difference uh, in terms of helping people's lives and improving their care across the board. And so that's where you have to go with that, relating it back to the mission. Uh, I will say our, our sister institution where our residency program is based, Denver Health, actually has uh, eliminate diversities as a component of their mission. So it, it's much easier to make that sale for, for them than it is for us. 
That being said, if you're able to tie it directly to one component of the mission, then it's very easy to explain to, to some of the administrative folks why it is that you need to go forward with certain things. And that's the idea behind holistic review, when we can expand that to recruitment and retention of faculty as well, too. So if, if, your, if your department's mission is to serve its community, well, who's in the community? You know, who's in the community? And so then what you're going to be looking for are people or faculty who are diverse, who have a commitment to, have a track record of helping your community or the demographics of your community. So we're going to rip through these last couple because I think we're already significantly over. Oh, really? Oh, good. Then we have tons of time. <laughs> I, I can slow back down. Oh, man. I thought we were out. Oh. Okay. Um, so in terms of assessment, uh, one of the questions is, what are you looking for? What are the exact data that you're looking for in terms of how you study whether or not you've been successful? And so for residency, it's the number that applied, the number that you offered interviews, the number that accepted interviews, the number that were ranked in a matchable range, the number that actually matched, the number of your externship co candidates who matched, and the number of second look candidates who matched, because you want to see whether your programs actually are effective, right? And we all know there's some element of randomness to the match, whether we like it or not, right? The students all laugh at that. <laughs> um, but you don't institute programs, you don't put money towards stuff and then look for an outcome at the other side. You've got to see what your outcome is. And so along those lines, when you're looking for those outcomes, you have to look at these numbers and if you measure them over time, then you expect that that's going to show you whether or not you've been successful. I think next one. So here, how many, how many, how many programs here keeps track? I mean, formally keeps track. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm actually doing some, some work now on the impact of uh, diversity sub eyes and its impact on, on resident composition. And it's, it's interesting how it's not, it's not necessarily tracked um, because it's not required. It's not required yet, but it sounds like it will be. We have a Uh, the, a GME office that screens. That sounds like Title IX. Maybe you could help me understand a little bit more. Just describe um, describe that process and what it looks. It's not, it's not visible. It, uh huh. Yeah, it's the, the so it's de-identified. So in in is an eros in eros it sounds like there's a lot of de-identification, de identifying information. So all you see is board scores and, and where they... So, so the question is essentially, if you don't have the gender um, or the ethnic identifiers that people put in, is there some other way of screening people? And the answer is definitely. And in fact, that's what we use, is we use, uh, I would say, I don't want to say surrogates, but to some extent that's what you're looking at. You're looking at what activities are people involved in? What activities have people done? And so whether they're, you know, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, you know, if they're involved in things that you feel are important for your community, then those are the kinds of things that you're going to screen for. So for example, and some people will say, well, that's, that's a marker for whatever it is. Well, I'm okay with that because even if they're not of that specific background, but they think that it's important, I'd still rather have that person there. So, um, for example, someone that is the president of the LGBT society at their school is somebody that I'd like at our institution. And whether that person actually ends up being an LGBT person or not is, to my mind, less material than the fact that they care about it. Yeah, I think that's, and that's the point of the holistic review, holistic application review at the UME level and the GME level, um, you know, which can be applied, is that we actually don't, we don't, are not consciously looking at um, identity, but more about what they are markers for and, and relating it to our mission. So, 
So they just, what else do they suppress? So they don't suppress other things, yeah. I kind of see that problematic. Melissa? Yes. So the, the, the comment or the question was, what do we do? Um, in t is it merit-based, in other words? So like we're looking at the meritocracy, and we don't de-identify. So that is in there. We see names. We see their identification at, at, at our program um, as well, too. And then we go and we do look at, we actually don't use, um, we don't really look at board scores at, at, at our institution, but we do look at their activities or volunteerism and the, what do they do, and that's what. Um, I think that's what Jeff was saying too. I think that the other component of this, and I, I'm sure that you all probably already know this, but we don't know what makes a good resident. We don't. Um, that's been shown over and over and over. Uh, the most recent article for emergency medicine that I saw is still out of San Diego, where they looked at 10 years worth of data, and basically they looked at people's rank when on their match list, they looked at their board scores, they looked at their letters of recommendation scores, et cetera, and then they correlated it with faculty's assessment of where those students, where those residents were when they graduated. No correlation, none at all. Um, same thing for every other residency program in the world, with the exception of orthopedics, who found that if you were involved in team sports that you were considered to do better at the end. I think that may be more of a reflection of ortho than anything else, but, uh, but otherwise, we don't know what makes a good doctor, period. Um, we don't know what make it, makes a good medical student, to be honest. Um, we can tell you that you know, the, one of the primary predictors of what makes a bad medical student is, is if you don't get immunized, if you don't turn your forms on time, et cetera, um, which I would love to make an admission criteria for our medical school. But, <laughs> but aside from that, we don't know. We just have no idea. That's what it comes down to. So it does make it difficult, and we have these other surrogates or markers, but some, yeah, something to keep in mind. There was an interesting study that came out by Pines and their group at, at GW on, um, and you know, this is getting a little bit off track, but on what are, um, not predictors, but what are qualities of um, great residents in, in emergency medicine. So they went over that um, a little bit, but it was interesting that none of that, and it was used a Delphi methodology, it had nothing to do with, the only thing pre, um, residency was the interview that came out out of that, but everything else, board scores, AOA status, um, uh, grades actually kind of fell out as, as indicators or markers of a successful EM resident, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, but again, the methodology, you can also argue, we, then we really don't know um, for that. I want to kind of go back to the, um, prog uh, the, um, the APE, the prog uh, Annual Program Evaluation if that's okay. And the next thing is we do want some metrics. I would also say that you can document in the APE that you can also put things that are qualitative, things that you are doing, efforts that you're making. So for instance, this is a, um, a survey um, that Jeff and some of his groups came out that looked at, hey, what do our underrepresented students, what are they looking for in a residency program? What do they want? And you'll see that there's, and comparing that to those who are not underrepresented, the stars on the left are are qualities that underrepresented minority students are look more looking for in there. And you'll notice what they have in there that, that we can actually do. So um, a, re a diversity statement on the website, that could help attract some people. If you have, um, if you have a program affirming commitment to diversity, so if they feel that, that's something that you can institute. There's other things that may be a little bit less, but it, it shows what's important to them, you know, mentorship and um, community outreach programs. And, all, most medical schools have community outreach programs, and that's things to highlight in your experience as a sub I. So there's things that you can write in the APE saying, hey, this is what we're trying to do to enhance diversity. Yes, this is our numbers, but these are our efforts as well. And then this one. Okay. So um, this is not just, we're not just talking um, about residents, as Jeff mentioned. So the focus was this, because it's ACGME, it has to do with residency. ACGB wants the whole program to be more diverse, and that means more than just residents. That also means faculty. That means senior leadership. So these are things that uh, they want to also mention as well, too. Um, I think a part of this, an extension of this, is, well, where do your residents go, especially those who are underrepresented? Where do they go? How do they do? How do they do in the program? How do they do during the residency? Things also to document. I think it's also really good for us to know, too, how is 
How is the environment of our residency program? How either inclusive, supportive, um, you know, one size does not fit all, and so what can we do as, as educators for our future physicians in order to help them be the best physician that they can be? I'm curious, how many of you in your institution track faculty per class? Yeah, that's a much smaller number. There's no question. Yeah. So actually, this is, this is our last slide, and it goes, it talks about faculty and how we are going to be tracking, uh, how you should be tracking them in the APE. And I think that there are a couple of key things that I think are, are a little different about faculty um, that sort of go without saying. But one is, is if you look at numbers six and number seven, um, that is crucial. Because the data on underrepresented minority faculty members is, is that they are more likely to leave academics than their non-underrepresented minority colleagues. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, talk about the minority tax, talk about uh, feeling distant and feeling, feeling uh, like you don't have enough support, uh, mentoring opportunities not being as frequent. So all these things sort of contribute to that, but that difference between number staying at two years and number staying at five years is a dramatic element. If you look at the data in terms of what, what, when people leave, it's usually between two and five years, and so that's one of those markers that you really need to look at. Um, one of the things that has been shown to make a huge difference for faculty is, first of all, bought down time, and then second of all, mentorship programs to assure that people are getting the mentorship that they need. Uh, we all know from both medical students, residents, and faculty that trying to force mentorship relationships is something that's very difficult um, and sometimes is unsuccessful. But that being said, it is one of the things that has been shown to make a difference across the board. Great. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and we'd like to answer any questions you may have in the time that we have left. So, this is great. It's especially great if, if you buy into this, if you, if you get it, if this is important to you. So my question is, what, is, what do you think, I, I know this is new, but what do you think the real consequences of getting a citation in this area what do you think the real consequences are from the ACGME? And the reason I ask that is my, my experience has been that the ACGME doesn't have real teeth in this area. So the LCME has plenty of teeth in this area. They have no problem putting a medical school on probation if they don't meet certain criteria, and you know, we submit the data, they can look at it, and they can say, you know what, you're not good enough in this area, we're putting you on probation. I, I've lived that, not, not the probation part, I've lived you know, seeing just how, right, that threat, just how much of an incentive it really is. Now, historically, you know, if you got, you can get 10 citations and if they're all tiny little things, nothing happens to your program. If you get one citation and it's uh, duty hours, if it's resident mistreatment, that might be enough to put you on probation. So I'm curious, because I'm sure you don't, you, you, we can't know because it's new, but what do you think the real consequences are? Meaning, what's the real incentive or disincentive for doing something like this? So I think that that's a great point, um, is how much the ACGME is going to actually weigh these kinds of citations and these kinds of issues. I, I do think that it's really interesting. Um, I forget which, which uh, emergency medicine program it was, but they were cited year after year after year for inadequate facilities, because to be honest, their emergency department was falling apart. Um, but they got the same citation every single year, and it made absolutely no difference, because it wasn't like they were like, oh, well, we'll just you know, put an extra you know, $100 million into building a new emergency department. So, they were like, oh, well, I, we cited you again. Oh, too bad, right? But there is no question that there are other programs that do receive probation for what would be considered citations that, that are not, I don't want to say not as major, but so it's possible that there are actually going to cite programs for this. My hope is, is that they do. And in general, I think that program directors will agree that if you get a citation once, that you move to address it. And if it doesn't get addressed the second time, and it's not a major thing, um, then 
whether they're going to cite you and put you on probation for it is, is a little questionable. But that being said, if it is something that's major, the chances that they're going to put you on probation for it are much higher. And so all I can say is, is that if I was a program director and I got cited for this, this would be one of the things that would be on my, on my target list. Because let's be honest, this is not really hard to do. This is not rocket science, right? I mean, saying, hey, I put in these following programs, we're starting to track this stuff, is pretty easy. And not the kind of thing that you're going to say, oh my gosh, well, I guess we'll risk probation for it. Now, I will agree with you. LCME is crazy. They put people on probation for, for, we got cited on our most recent visit for not enough locker space for medical students. <laughs> Let me tell you, there are now 200 lockers. <laughs> like that. I mean, it was amazing, you know. Um, and the ACGME does not have that kind of reputation. There is no question. But my hope is, is that these kinds of things will make them have that kind of reputation. I also think that all citations will not be viewed the same with different people. So you get cited because of conference. You get cited because of this or that. When it comes to the, when it comes to the resident survey, they take that very seriously. And I think you have to reveal some of these to applicants. So when you have a citation that says, you're not diverse enough. It's a reputation thing, too. I mean, it's a personal thing. I think that sounds different than some of the other citations that you could, you could obtain um, there. And I do think the implicit message, well, maybe not so implicit, about having these requirements is you start looking at it. You start thinking about it. You're mindful about how you shape your residency program. Hi. Um, so Kyle and I are both leaders at our emergency medicine interest group in at Howard, and we've had many program directors come by and residents also to go to speak about their program. And the number one question that our students always ask is the step one matter, and you know, like how else? Like basically, the step one matter. And the consensus answer has been, how else do you expect us to go through thousands and thousands of applications for 10 to 12 spots? Um, and I guess, yes, it makes sense. So, and we've seen the numbers of how once you factor step one and you put a cutoff, how many applications you're actually like, you know, not looking at. Um, I guess the two questions that I have is one, what would you recommend um, that we tell our students when we go back, like how else we can like, you know, uh, evade um, those problems if possible? And um, do you think there's anything that's gonna happen this uh, upcoming cycle that can change that? So the question, just to reiterate, was two parts. First is, is how, what do you tell people about step one and its association with getting into residency? And then secondarily, what do you tell people, uh, I guess secondarily was, is there going to be a change to the way that step one is looked at going forward? Um, can I take the second part first and then I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give David the, the first part because that's the harder <laughs> part. Um, so on the national level, at the LCME level, um, the use of step one has been a concern. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons that the SVI now exists is to, in theory, give an alternative uh, metric for programs to look at. Uh, I personally don't know if that's necessarily the, the right metric, especially considering we have no data that ties it to anything else. Um, and it has some biases implicit in it also. Uh, so we can talk about that for another couple hours if you want. Um, but what I would say is, and there has been a national question about moving step one to pass fail, right? Because moving step one to pass fail sort of eliminates this. Uh, but then the question is, is if you take that away from program directors, what the heck are they going to look at? And is it going to be a matter of looking at all these holistic, uh, holistic elements and that's going to be the entire gestalt of what it is that they look at? I will tell you that there's also been a national movement to try and standardize the MSPE, the Medical Student Performance uh, Evaluation, also known as the Dean's Letter. Uh, which about 70% of all medical schools have actually adopted. That being said, when you still look at across the different medical schools, there's still a wide variation. So for example, you're like, oh, somebody honored at Harvard. Is that, is that good? Well, that's actually the second level down. There's actually high honors also. So actually, that's not the top person there. So, so you know, some of these things are, are really a little more difficult. Or there are some schools that don't, that it's pass-fail for everything. So what are you doing with that? Um, so the easy answer is, is I don't know. Um, would I like to think, see things change? Yes. Would I like to see pass-fail happen for step one? Yes. Do I think that's the solution for everything? No. Um, I don't have a brilliant solution for you. So that's, that's the answer the, for the second half is, is I don't know. 
we're unfortunately not there yet. We are having a national discussion now. That's why this information is so important to disseminate, to spread, for us to talk to our faculty about so that we all understand this. Most people don't know this data. Most people don't know this is a national discussion. It's really important that we, it doesn't help you now, it doesn't help your underclassmen right now because we are in this movement. But I think it's picking up speed. So I, in, a, in the medical education, um, there's a journal club that I do um, and we review, we scour the major medical education journals. Step one is coming up. I mean, last year it came up some, and, and this year is coming up even more. The debate based upon what to do with standardized test score is increasing in the major medical education literature. It does feel good. It does feel that there are some changes, but right now, we don't have that. Yeah. Um, so I'm the emergency medicine representative for Oakdale, which is the Organization of Program Director Associations. So it's basically membership across the House of Medicine. We just had our meeting in Chicago last week. Well, we meet every six months. And that was a huge discussion as this whole what's going to happen with, you know, the step one scores. And if you're not familiar with it, there was this big conference, INCAS, which was a big discussion about whether or not uh, step one is going to go to pass fail or not. There have not been um, any firm conclusions on it, but the uh, representative from, um, you know, the Yosemite sort of organization and the AMC give a really, really great discussion about how it's not about the step one score. That's actually not the problem. It's about this bigger issue of holistic review and the problem is the, you know, UME to GME transition and how programs are looking at, you know, all of these applications and what is being used for filtering. And the, unfortunately, you know, they had a lot of representation at this conference, you know, program directors and all sorts of stakeholders. What I heard is that the programs across the House of Medicine, you know, the GME side of it, yeah, they don't want this to go past fail, right? Because the, just for this very reason of, of you know, using this as a, as a filter. But there's this huge push to figure out some other way to either score it differently, like in big chunks and like quartiles, or to do something else with that score so it's not used in the same way that it's being used now. And I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to hear how much discussion was going on to figure out a, a solution to the real problem, which is not that score, but it's how we're looking at these applications and the bias involved in that. So, you know, what will happen this summer is look out because there's going to be a public forum opportunity to comment on that issue. And so you want to, you know, add your voice to the conversation as well. That's going to happen in like July-ish. And then they're going to talk again with all the stakeholders. And then there is going to be actual, you know, sort of more final conclusions made. But there's going to be stuff going on this summer. So sort of be on the lookout if this is something that, that's mattering to you. Uh, good question. Um, I'll see if I can figure it out, um, but I think what, what he said in there was that basically there's just going to be a, let me find out. I'll, I'll email the guy who talked in, and I, I feel like this is something, especially with our, our organization, that, you know, it's like something we should promote to say, if this matters to you, you know, speak up about it and, and give your opinion. So I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. How many questions do we have? One, two, one, two. Okay. Can you talk more about uh, recruiting a diverse facu faculty? You know, it's one thing to do a residence that's, you kind of have a pool and, and you kind of have some choice. Uh, faculty recruitment, you're kind of dependent on who puts in an application. Um, you know, I, well, it's probably not an externship, but, you know, what's, what's the nuts and bolts of kind of recruiting diverse faculty? So, so... The uh, easy answer is, first, aim for your residents, because your residents are more likely to stay than anyone else. So that, that's the easy answer is, is aim for your residents. The second component is, is recruiting at places and at things, people that you know that are interested. So like, I don't know, SAEM that happens to have diversity workshops and, you know, looking around the room, you know that the people in this room care about diversity. And so those are the people that you're going to try and recruit in terms of trying to get them to your institution. There's also the, uh, the ADIEM speakers board, and so bringing in people that have professed an, ex an expertise in a specific diverse rela related um, area, bringing them in to speak is also an opportunity to try and recruit them to stay, right? 
So that's two easy ways to do it. Now, that being said, the other component is, is getting your name out there. Because if people know that it's important at your institution, it's something that they care about, they're more likely to reach out to you to try and apply for a job there. Right? If they know that you're one of the places that publishes about diversity, then they're going to be more interested in going to your institution. If they know that diversity is important at your program, they're going to show up. If they see folks from your institution showing up year after year after year at diversity conferences or things like that, then they're going to be the people that are going to be interested in going to your institution. I also think that creating a culture is, a, is one way to do it. This is harder to do, but what I I'm talking about is at, at our shop, for our faculty, we um, instituted different, um, and we had this, fortunately had the support of the chair to institute certain workshops. So there's a diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop. Then there was um, learning how to mentor across differences. And we all got, it's part of faculty development. How do you mentor someone that's not like you? Um, Relationship-centered communication, like things that um, start building up a, a culture that it is important. A diversity committee, having residents and diversity committee. I think actually some of our, um, our some of the loudest and most uh, powerful voices are our residents who are asking for more diverse faculty. Um, and it's, it's um, pretty, pretty amazing, though it's, uh, that's a slow kind of build. That's definitely a slow kind of build. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and then, yeah. Oh, to that one, sorry, 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 sorry. I was just gonna also state, don't, don't just depend, so it doesn't just have to be departmental. So usually within the institution, there's a chief diversity officer or something like that. Utilize that person because that person may know resources outside. I mean, it's a, it's a small network. I mean, especially as it comes to the kind of diversity and inclusion work, a lot of us know each other at other institutions that are doing the same type of work. And so utilize the person, you know, that's already being paid, you know, <laughs> basically that's part of their job is to help you recruit for your department, I mean, in, in a way. So utilize that person, utilize the diversity officer within your medical school because for the same reasons, you know, there's organizations like the WMC GDI, a group on diversity and inclusion. There's, although, you know, a lot of uh, deal with uh, UME, they also deal with GME issues. And so it's just kind of networking from that angle in addition to the department. So in the spirit of holistic review and trying to attract and retain a diverse resident body, we'll use that example, how have you all found the blinding process? We talked about it a bit before, but blinding, for example, race and ethnicity data in that initial round when looking at applicants. Because I've, I've had, I am especially looking for those people and I have the bias of being attracted but I know that there are many people who have the opposite bias, um, so I could see how it would be, a, it, it would work in some ways and not work in others. It makes me work harder, because I have to dig through, you know? So it depends on who it is that's looking. So um, I used to look at all of our all of our students who fell into URM categories, and we would filter that way. But I would look at every single application, and I was looking at it with a positive lens. So from my mind, that wasn't, wasn't a negative at all. Um, you can imagine somebody that's looking at the same data and is filtering it with a negative lens is going to have a, much, a dramatically different impact in terms of the number of students that are invited for interviews and what their overall scores are. So I think it really depends. Now I will say, blinding definitely makes life a little easier in terms of talking to, to folks that want to um, want to set, set up a playing field that is differently leveled, I guess would be the way that I would phrase it. Um, because we know that, that equity and equality are not the same thing. So with that being said, I think that it is important that you also weight some of those components of holistic review so that you're bringing in the folks that you really want. Did that answer your question? I just wanted to sort of elaborate a, a little bit more because I think it's a really interesting question. But I also think that um, resident selection for your program is not a meritocracy. 
it's not a, there's no objective ranking of every medical student going into EM and you're always trying to build a class and, a, and a, um, find the people who will really flourish in your particular training environment and who will bring um, you know like particular skills and be able to like build the kind of culture that you want in a program so I think to pretend that we are somehow able to like divine from USMLE scores or whatever it is um, the like metric worth of each of these students is silly um, and that I, that to, if you really want to embrace building a program and a cult and uh, and a department then you have to look at every aspect of of an applicant um, and then and to pretend that we're like colorblind is, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think you're lying to yourself. I don't know if that made sense, I'm very tired. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I agree. And now we're over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone.